In the book of Job, Job vacillates between praising God at times and at other times complaining to God. And when he complains to God, he complains to God about God himself, about God's apparent lack of control of the world. So by the end of the book, God has two responses to that in two speeches. In the first speech, God basically says to Job, um, where were you when I created the world? And he, he talks about, God talks about his power and his authority and the original intent of that creation. To give one example among dozens, God talks about the two star constellations of Pleiades and Orion and how the stars give glory to God. And then in the second speech, chapters 40 and 41, God talks about what has gone wrong in the world. Those two chapters are actually bookended by the word and the concept of pride, sinful pride, arrogance, and what that results in, what that leads to. God, in essence, talks about the fall in the Garden of Eden and how we've lived with that ever since. And the question to Job in that second speech is, Job, can you bring the proud low? Can you do anything to help or control this? And of course, the answer is no. On a scale of one to a thousand, Job can't even score a one in terms of controlling the people around him, bringing the proud low. So Job finally says something very true and accurate and wise in chapter 42, verse 2. Job says to God, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So may we take comfort in those words and in that affirmation uh, this morning and this day. As you know, we're not meeting uh, today, Sunday, March 15, due to uh, the virus, COVID-19. Just give you one reason why we're not meeting. Uh, we don't know how many people might be carriers of this, and they don't know it. To give you a quick example, you've heard or read about the cruise ship, the Diamond Princess. Uh, there were, I think, roughly 660 people diagnosed with the virus. And here's what's interesting. Of that 660, about half, 330 or so, had no idea they had the virus, no symptoms at the time of their testing. So this one, we don't know how many people uh, in the city or even in our congregation might have the virus and not know it. So please pray for us uh, as elders as we have decisions to make uh, in the next few days about resuming services, as we think and pray through how to help and shepherd you, our people, and the community around us. To give you just one example of the latter, we're already talking with Los Ranchos Elementary School, a public Title I school that we've already partnered with, on how we can help, uh, especially their parents, since their kids won't have uh, provided meals uh, by the government in the next two weeks. So we're daily working on a few dozen things at any given point in time. Uh, our preaching pastor, Ryan, is not with us today. He's actually driving back, uh, getting his two daughters home from a university that had to cancel the rest of their semester. So lots of things going on, uh, but a good, great, and sovereign God that we trust in. Drew's going to be praying for us, for our city, for our world a little bit later in the service. For now, please pray with me for our service. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the word uppercase W, for Jesus, for God incarnate, God among us. We thank you for the word lowercase w, the words that you gave to the apostles that we will look at and cherish and apply and respond to today. Father, help this virus not to dominate our thinking, our emotions, our actions. Rather, let Christ dominate our thinking and our feelings and our actions. Jesus, we have been purchased by your blood. We belong to you. And we owe you all of our love, obedience, and devotion. Father, help us to respect and even obey when we can the human authorities you've placed over us, but ultimately our respect and obedience goes to Jesus. 
Our love, our fear, our following, our hearts, our lives go to him. And we pray that through the songs, through the prayers, through the preaching of your word, this day you would refresh us and renew us. In Jesus' name and for his glory, for the good and reputation of his name, we pray these things. Amen. Let us stand and hear from God's word. Be called to worship from Psalm 148. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Let us join all of heaven and earth this morning in giving praise to our God and King.
joyful, joyful we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of life is often mixed with sorrow. Sorrow because of the sin in this world and the sin that still remains in our hearts. So let us once again go together and confess together our sin and our helplessness apart from his mercy.
Even in the face of real physical threat, we know that our greatest need is still spiritual. So let us go to the one who holds both body and soul and ask for his help. Let's pray together. God of heaven and earth, our help, our refuge, our fortress, in whom we trust. We need your help and your healing today. We need your wisdom and work among us. Father, Heal those that are sick and help them to be satisfied in you. Protect those that are near the sick and help them to know your name. And we ask for wisdom for many, for doctors and health professionals that will be overwhelmed with patients and questions, even those in our congregation. Deliver them by your wisdom and cover them in your peace. For wisdom for our leaders, for the government, for our president, for governors, for the mayor and state officials that have and will have to again make difficult decisions that will affect the lives of millions. Let them bear the burden of authority with wisdom and grace for your glory and our good. And we ask for help for our brothers and sisters around the world who will be unable to travel or get home to their loved ones, rescue them from this trap and be their peace. We ask for wisdom for our elders to be filled with the knowledge of your will and to act with conviction, caution, and care for this flock. We ask for your provision and protection for the most vulnerable among us, our oldest and our youngest. Cause them to know the help and healing in the shadow of you, the Almighty, and lead us to be quick to their care and comfort. And help us to love our neighbors, to look up from our own needs to the needs of those around us and bear their burdens. And move us all from fear to faith. Move us from panic to patience, from trembling to trust. We ask that you would stop the spread of this virus and use it to spread your fame through the gospel that we would see an end to our control and submit ourselves to the one who controls all things. From the sun and the moon to the smallest microorganisms, you are God. We recognize today that we live under your sovereign hand of protection and nothing can snatch us out. Not tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. We know that if you are for us, nothing can be against us. And we thank you, we praise you, God, the one that conquered death and gave us victory through Jesus our Lord. We can be sure, sure that neither life nor death nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor coronavirus nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Now let us stand and continue in, in prayer through song as we sing for his help.
Lord, we come to hear your word. Shine your light, unsheath your sword. Send your spirit forth in power. Come and bless your church this hour. We confess. Our thoughts have strayed, minds distracted and dismayed on the sun. Fix now each thought and help us worship as we are. Lord, as we prepare to hear. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning. What a weird week, right? I uh, woke up Wednesday morning fully expecting that this time we would all be gathered together in this room listening to Dr. Albert Moeller teach us about uh, the, the glorified mind. And yet, uh, here we are now. It's just one more reminder of of how little control we have and how quickly things can change. And it's another reminder that God's word never changes. And so in the midst of uh, unexpected circumstances and things not going how we planned, we can always turn to God, our refuge and our fortress, our God in whom we trust. So let's listen to him now from his word. If you've got your Bible, why don't you go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be in chapter 4 this morning, just continuing in the series that we've been in through this epistle by the Apostle Paul to a church in Thessalonica in the first century. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll be reading verses 9 to 12. So let me read these verses together, and then we'll pray, and we'll hear from God in his word. So this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands 
as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, we do thank you that your word never changes. The the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. So no matter what happens, Lord, you are our constant, and I pray that you would cause us to turn our thoughts rightly to your word now and encourage us and bless us and sanctify us by it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you were with us last week, you know that we have turned in this letter to the instructional portion of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the, the first three chapters really are Paul giving an extended thanksgiving for God's work in protecting and preserving this church through persecution. And we saw at the end of chapter 3 that Paul gives a prayer to God that sort of precedes and foreshadows what will follow in the rest of the book. Paul prays that God our Father would make the Thessalonians Increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that their hearts may be established blameless in holiness at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Love and holiness in eager expectation of the return of Christ. Last week as we started chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, we saw this love and holiness pertaining to our bodies and especially to sexual purity. And here in verses 9 to 12, we see this love and holiness lived out primarily in regard to our work, our vocation, our labors. But it's interesting and I think very helpful that in these verses that are ultimately about our work, how we go about our work, that they are fundamentally rooted in love, which is a connection that I don't know that we are always quick to make. So we've got just two points in our outline today, and that begins with this idea of love. So in verses 9 to 10, we get the labor of love. The labor of love. And if you remember that phrase, it's coming from chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul thanks God for the, Th- the Thessalonians' work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So their labor of love. Verse 9 begins with Paul saying, now concerning brotherly love. That word is Philadelphia. It's, it's a composite word. It's got the word love and brother stuck together. It's a, it's a special kind of love that in literature outside of the New Testament always refers to the kind of love that you would have for blood relations. It is family love, the love that you have for your brothers. Now, what's interesting is that in the New Testament, as we've even seen throughout the book of 1 Thessalonians, this idea of family love has been reappropriated and applied to the spiritual community of the church. This is... This is something that I don't think we, we grasp the, the real radical nature of. Because in the Greco-Roman culture that this book was written to and, and at the time that Christianity came out, the idea of brotherly love, the love that you have towards someone in your family was very strong. You had a strong commitment, a strong obligation to someone that was in your own family. But outside of your family, or maybe a little broader outside of your extended family, maybe your tribe, outside of these people that you had some kind of blood relationship to, there was no obligation. There was no sense of commitment. There was no sense of of love. And yet here come these Christians, and they called one another brother in the sense that that commitment and that obligation extended to anyone that had been purchased by the blood of Christ and brought into the household of God. We were all a new family, and those kind of commitments that that idea of family carried with it in the culture extended to everyone in the church. And this was radical. This was countercultural. This was weird. This weirded people out. In the second century, so the 100s, Justin Martyr, who was a Christian apologist, he wrote this. He said, we who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring what we have into a common fund and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. 
But now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. We live like a new family and we meet one another's needs. Also in the second century, another apologist, Tertullian, wrote an apology, and, and in that he said that the opponents of Christianity often branded Christians almost disdainfully by saying, see how they love each other. It was strange the way that the church acted and cared for one another, but it is this kind of brotherly love that, that the church was supposed to exhibit. Isn't that what Jesus said? By this they will know you're my disciples, by your love for one another. And so Paul turns to this idea of brotherly love in this epistle, and what does he say about the Thessalonians? Again in verse 9, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So the Thessalonians were killing it. They had this brotherly love thing down. Not only were they exercising familial brotherly love in their own community, but that was overflowing into the whole region of Macedonia in northern Greece. And I wish, oh, don't you? I just wish we had more details about what that love would look like, that Paul would say, you guys don't need any help here. I wish I could know what that community looked like, but I think that we can look to other examples from the early church that we have written down from this same time that can give us an idea of this radical countercultural love. Rodney Stark is a, a sociologist and a historian. He wrote a book in the 90s called The Rise of Christianity, and at the time that he wrote the book, he was not a Christian. He has since come to profess faith in Christ, but um, in this book that's very historically researched, he's, he's uh, turning to a lot of um, even archaeological artifacts and things like that. In that book, uh, through his research, he paints this really amazing picture of the early church in the first few centuries as, as a community that provided social welfare for the members of this family in such a radical and powerful way that it stood out in the rest of the Roman Empire, which was largely a society that had no kind of social safety net, that had no way of supporting the vulnerable and the poor and those that were in need. And Stark's thesis in this book is actually that this welfare and this charity that the church was providing for its members was one of the most attractive things about the faith, that the the dispossessed and those who were in need would be drawn to this community because it was a place where they could have material needs met and then more when they came into that community that they were given a transcendent hope. And that it was those factors, that charity and that hope that made Christianity go from this marginal, almost Jewish sect into the dominant religion in the Roman Empire in just three centuries. And, and we would, you know, go beyond that and say, obviously, it was God's work through the Holy Spirit accomplishing what his purposes were. But there's something to that love being displayed. Stark writes this in that book. To cities filled with the homeless and impoverished, Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachments. To cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense a family. To cities torn by violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for social solidarity. And to cities faced with epidemics, fires, and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services. And it's that last point that brought this book to mind. I've been thinking about this book quite a bit in recent weeks. In AD 165, a plague, probably smallpox, smallpox, spread through the entire Roman Empire, and it killed maybe a quarter to a third of the population. And then about a century later, in 250 AD, another plague moved through the empire, this time probably measles, and it had the same devastating effect. And at that time, in the Greco-Roman world, the common practice when a plague would hit was for, one, all of the rich people to leave the cities, to leave the population areas, including the doctors. As soon as the doctors knew that a plague was coming, they would not stay. They would go to their country estates to try and get as far away from the sickness 
as they could. And those that could not leave, well, they tried to distance themselves as much as possible from those that were sick in the most inhumane ways possible. Even if they had a family member or a loved one that they knew was sick, they would lock them up in the house without any help, probably to die. Or they would literally throw them into the streets to try and avoid catching the disease. But during those same plagues in the second and third centuries, you know what the Christians did? This is from Bishop Dionysius in the third century. He writes, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And what's amazing about these accounts is these diseases, these plagues that went through the empire at that time, they were serious, but if you had someone even providing limited nursing care, the chance of you surviving that illness went up by about 60%. So if someone came near to you, probably risking getting sick themselves, but if someone came near to you and made you food and gave you water, your chance of survival went up dramatically. And it's amazing that you can go to the tombstones from this time and you can see that the Christians, on average, lived longer than the pagans because they cared for each other. They nursed each other. See how they loved each other. And I want to be really clear right here. I'm not making a comment about how we should respond to this coronavirus crisis right now. We live in a very different period than these Christians did. They were providing the nursing care because there were not hospitals. All the doctors were leaving. And so they saw a need, a gap in their society, and they stepped in and they met it. So I'm not advocating that we all rush in to be really close to those people that are sick. We should be glad that we have modern health care and a a medical system that can step up and meet these needs. And I would even argue this is something of a tangent, but I would say the fact that we have such a good health care system in our country is because our culture is so deeply rooted in this Christian ethic. That is why we have the, the structures and the, and the safety net that we have in place right now. They did not have that in the second century. But I have been wondering, as events have been unfolding in our own country, what does it look like for us as a church to respond appropriately but with the same kind of brotherly love in this context today? What does it look like for us to show that radical countercultural concern for our brothers and sisters in the midst of this epidemic? Yes, we have nurses and hospitals, but we can do our best, I think, to not overwhelm that system. That's one of the reasons that we have decided not to meet together as a large gathering today because that will hopefully slow down the spread of this epidemic. It will help those hospitals and those nurses and those doctors be able to take care of those who are sick well. That is a way for us to love our neighbors is by not meeting together. But what if we find out someone in our congregation or someone that we know is, uh, contracts the coronavirus? Well, we can text them and see if they have all the groceries that they need. We can make them soup and bring it to them. We can make sure that they have everything that they need to stay where they are for the next couple of weeks. We can offer to watch people's kids because the schools have all been canceled, but they still have to go to work. We can offer to host international students from universities that have been shut down for the rest of the semester, but they're not able to go back to the countries from which they came. We can just be creative and brotherly. We can think about how can we meet one another's needs in this time in such a way that the world looks at us and says, see how they love each other. And even beyond the current situation, we can all just learn to grow in showing more brotherly concern for following up, for texting and making sure that everyone's needs are met and sharing our own needs with our family so that we can all grow together 
and love. That is what the Thessalonians were doing, not just in their own church, but throughout the whole region. But there's one more really important observation that we can make from these verses that Paul says when he says, we don't need to teach you how to love one another. He says, it's because you have been taught by God. You have been taught by God to love one another. That is incredible. What is that? What does that mean? Paul may have left the Thessalonians too soon. He may have felt like he was not able to continue this church's instruction in the faith. But even though Paul had left, this church was not alone. God was with them. They had genuine faith in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they had the Holy Spirit within them teaching them, applying what they knew of God's word to their own lives so that they could learn and be taught by God to live out the life of faith in godliness. I mean, isn't that what the new covenant promise is in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, that God will give his spirit to this new covenant community so that no one will need to teach one another. They will all be taught by God. Paul is saying that that prophecy is being fulfilled in the Thessalonian church, that they just know what it is to love one another. They recognize that they have been bound together as a new man, a new kingdom, a new people, a new family. They know how to love one another. Because that kind of radical, self-sacrificial love is the heart of the gospel that they believed in. Dionysius, that bishop that I cited before from the third century, when he was writing about the Christian response to those epidemics, he wrote that many of those Christians who were nursing the sick did, in fact, themselves become sick. He says that The sickness of their neighbors, they cheerfully drew unto themselves. Many in nursing and curing others transferred even their death to themselves and died in their stead. These brothers and sisters were willing to go to someone who was dying and heal them, taking their death on themselves and dying in their place so that they could have life. Why do you think they would do that? Because that's what Jesus did for them. That is what Jesus has done for us. Our sin is a sickness, one that will not lead only to physical death, but eternal death the just, eternal wrath of a perfectly good and holy God. So I wonder, do you you recognize that you have this need in the midst of all of the other scary things going on? Do you recognize that this is your biggest problem? It's not the coronavirus. It's not your 401k getting gutted. It's not war with another country. It's not politics. Any of those things, though they are serious, only apply to this life. But as Jesus says in Matthew, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We have a much bigger problem than anything going on in this life. The problem is our sin, this sickness that infects each of us. And what did Christ do? He saw us in our sickness, and he didn't say, I'm going to distance myself from them. He says, I will come near them like their brother. I will take on flesh and blood like they have, and I will take their sickness onto myself. And I will die the death that they justly deserve to die. I will die in their place so that they can be healed Peter writes, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He who was rich became poor for our sake that we might inherit with him. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you believe this? 
Do you know this gospel? Do you know the need that you have? Are you aware of your sickness? And have you known the healing touch of the great physician? If you have, have you been taught by God to love like this? To live out that same gospel, even if it means that you stand to lose something. You see the need that someone else has And you say, out of the same love that God has shown me, I will love them to meet that need. Can people say of us, see how they love one another? They could of the Thessalonians. And so what does Paul tell them to do at the end of verse 10? He says, you guys are killing it at loving one another. So do so more and more. Grow in this. This is like what he prayed in chapter 3, that it would increase and abound. It would overflow, that the love that they have would keep pumping up from within them, that it would spill over the rim out into those around them. And I think in our second point, Paul's going to give them one particular way that they can do this. I think that's how this text flows. He says, love one another more and more and how you work. So in verses 9 and 10, we had the labor of love. Verses 11 and 12, our second point, we have the love of labor, or the love that is demonstrated through our labor. And as I said, we don't often make this connection of love and labor. We often view our labor as nothing more than a means to an end. It's a necessary evil. It's something that we don't really like, but we have to endure so that we can get to the things that are actually important in life, or at least we can retire at some point. And there may actually be something to that, that feeling that we have that we don't always enjoy our work, because we know that from Genesis 3, work was cursed by God. It was a response that God had to the the sin that Adam and Eve committed in the garden, that Adam would tend to his fields, he would work hard, and only by the sweat of his brow would it produce fruit. And along with that, thorns and thistles, that his work would just be hard. We see the same thing for Eve, whose work was to produce children, that there would be pain in her childbearing and in her child rearing, that both of those aspects of labor of mankind were affected by the fall, but remember that even though work was cursed in Genesis 3, work was not the curse. Work was something that existed before the fall. And in fact, Adam had a job before he had a wife. So some of you high school guys need to pay attention to that. Work existed before the fall as part of the purpose that God built into mankind. We are meant to work. We are meant to be productive. We are meant to be fruitful and multiply, to subdue the earth and have dominion. We are meant to, as the image of God, be creative in this life. And so I think because that was how God made us in the beginning, even in the new heavens and the new earth, we'll still be working. I don't know what that will look like. But I think working is intrinsic to our nature. And so in this time of the already and not yet, as Christians, what we are called to do is have a right and redeemed understanding of work. And in particular, how our work fulfills the loving purposes of God in the world. And the issue here in Thessalonica, I think, was that some of these members of this church did not have that right view of their labor. I think this is why this point comes out. If you have a broader reading of both First and, Thessalo- First and Second Thessalonians, it looks like there was a group of people in this church who were not working. In chapter 5, verse 14 of First Thessalonians, Paul tells the church to admonish the idol. The idol. There were some idle people there that needed to be corrected, or that could be translated undisciplined or unruly. In Second Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul writes this, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, 
nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So clearly there was a contingent of people in this church who had an inaccurate understanding of work, and so they were not working. They were being idle. And there's some theories as to why they were doing this. We don't know exactly what the situation was going on. We're kind of reading in between the lines here. I think it's important to note that this was not unemployment. These brothers and sisters were not unable to work. They were unwilling to work. Many commentators think that their unwillingness was somehow connected to a wrong understanding about Christ's return. This certainly is a predominant theme in the book of First and Second Thessalonians about a right understanding of when and how and what it will be like when Jesus comes back and how we're to live in light of that coming. Maybe these people had a misunderstanding of the end times and thought, well, Jesus is going to be back like any minute. So what's the point of working? Let's just kind of live off of our savings because when he's here, this is all going to be meaningless. And so they had put up their feet. We're just waiting for Christ to come back. Or maybe it was a little bit more spiritual than that. Maybe that they thought in in light of just the profound importance of the gospel, that there wasn't any point in doing this manual labor. What we really needed to be doing was preaching the gospel and reading our Bibles and praying more. And so they were almost, what's the phrase? They were too heavenly minded, so they were no earthly good. Regardless of what was really going on, the fact is what we can tell from First and Second Thessalonians is that, is that they were not working and so they were not pulling their fair share. They were being a burden on this church that was otherwise offering so much social support, that was being so charitable and so generous. They were not contributing to that mission. They were only taking from the mission and in so doing, they were being unloving. They were being bad brothers and sisters. So let's think for a moment how this applies to our own church. Maybe there are some of you, and and as you hear this, you know in your heart that this is true. That you are being idle. You are being undisciplined. You are being unwise with your finances. And it has forced you to turn again and again to maybe our church or to members in our church to get financial support, to get help. They are loving you, but you are not loving them. I think in our context, this would also apply to someone who attends this church or maybe is even a member in this church, but you're not contributing financially. You're benefiting from the ministry of this church, maybe not materially, but you're benefiting from the teaching. You're benefiting from the shepherding. You're benefiting from the singing. You're benefiting from the prayer, but you're not contributing to that work. And you're certainly not contributing to the kind of benevolence ministry that this church does to helping our poor brothers and sisters, to meeting needs in our community and meeting needs around the world. Don't you think that that's worthwhile? Don't you realize that we could be doing more? And again, maybe there are those of you who who in fact are giving. You've got the online giving thing set up and it just comes in every month, but you are not loving like a brother or a sister. You are, yes, contributing to the financial needs, but you are not concerned about the needs that your brothers and sisters around you might have. You're not checking in on them. They don't know what your needs are. That's not a family. How would your family feel if you sent them a check every month but you never called to see how they were doing? These are all ways of being unloving with regard to our work and to our fellowship, just like these idle Thessalonians were being. Okay, They were the recipients of the benefits of the church without contributing And so they were creating an undue burden. And more than that, it seems like they were being really annoying. 
You see that? Paul keeps on pointing out that they're busy bodies. They're not busy at work. They're busy bodies. They're all up in everybody else's business. I think you wonder why. You remember back then, well, there wasn't Netflix. So if you didn't have a job, it wasn't like you were just sitting at home. You had to entertain yourself somehow. And so they were just gossiping and causing drama, maybe even theological drama. If nothing else, they were just distracting everybody else from the work that they were supposed to be doing. And so they were a problem in more ways than one. This was, this was a real problem in this church. And so what does Paul do? Well, in 2 Thessalonians, like we saw, he tells the church to cut them off, maybe even remove them from membership. He certainly says, quit enabling them. If they're not willing to work, don't let them eat. But in 1 Thessalonians, he states things a little bit more positively. He gives the positive side of that coin, and he gives a beautiful vision of Christian labor. In three commands, he says, aspire to live quietly, mind your own affairs, and work with your hands as we instructed you. I think you could sum up all three of those as put your head down and work for the good of your brothers and sisters. Briefly, I just want to look at all three of these commandments. He says, aspire to live quietly. It's almost an oxymoron. It's like, be ambitious, have your ambition to be unremarkable. Quiet means humble, submitting to authorities, not disruptive, not calling attention to yourself, not glory-seeking. He says, make that your ambition, to work quietly and humbly. I think today, in our context, this is an encouragement for us to be content with the job that we have. I know when you were growing up, your teacher told you that you could be an astronaut, or you could be president, or you could be any of these other exciting things. Let me just say, if you are not that or well on your way to being that, then maybe God has not called you to that. And instead of being discontent that you are not what you wanted to be all the time that you were growing up, instead, make it your ambition to do well the job that God has actually called you to. Put your head down and work hard. Not idolatrously obsessing over having a better job or a more exciting job or a more different job. That's actually very selfish, that heart. Do you understand that? That is an unloving view because that says, what does my job do for me instead of what does my job do for others? Which is what Paul is commending us to in this passage. So aspire to live quietly. He also says, mind your own affairs. Don't be busybodies the way that these Thessalonians were who were disrupting everyone else's lives okay spend your time actually being productive and then you'll just realize that these other concerns that you had the the drama and the disagreements that they just go away because you don't have time to worry about them because you're actually doing what God wired us to do which is to work and be productive you're not going to spend that productive energy on on useless quarrels and disagreements and I have to say that I have been personally helped by this command, mind your own affairs, as, a, as an admonition to be careful with how much I invest in social media. Because you know, you know this, that, that social media is just a recipe for discontentment, even as it relates to our jobs. Okay, we check in one more day to a job that we just really can't stand, and we get on Facebook and we see that our college roommate, their job just seems to get cooler. Okay, maybe now you're a stay-at-home mom, but then you see your other friends and they're still doing these other things and posting these other things and you become frustrated and discontent with the job that you have. Well, listen, God has not called you to their job. He's called you to your job. Mind your own business. And lastly, Paul says, work with your hands as we instructed you. It doesn't mean that we all need to go out and get manual labor jobs, okay? I would be in trouble if that's what that meant. What this means is that if we're able, we need to earn our own living, and we need to work hard at it, and we certainly don't need to be doing what these idle Christians were doing, which is taking when we can be giving. 
Paul himself, again and again, is putting himself forward as an example of this. That's why he concludes verse 11 by saying, as we instructed you. Remember in chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. The apostles were quiet, not glory-seeking. They were gentle. They were hard-working. They worked with their hands. Remember that Paul was a tent maker. He came into this city and he worked manually so that he would not be dependent on the Thessalonians financially, but rather they would be in a position where they could give the gospel to the Thessalonians. And why did they do that? What did he say? They were affectionately desirous. The Thessalonians were very dear to them. They loved the Thessalonians like what? Like a family. And they saw it as their role to contribute, to work hard that they could love this church like a family. So that's where this all comes back to our first point. We are to love one another more and more. And if we can get our minds and our hearts around the role that our work plays in this call to love one another, then I think it transforms the way we go about our jobs. This will radically shift your perspective on the way that you show up to your role in life, whether that's a role in a a professional workplace or as a stay-at-home parent or as a student or whatever role God has called you to be in. We realize that the purpose that we are there is to be loving, to work on behalf of other people the way that Jesus worked for us. So how do we do this? What does this look like, to have this perspective of love as it applies to our work? We could go on and on, but, but just for a moment, think about the nature of your job, really of every job. Whatever it is, every job is an act of service, isn't it? Every company, every company that exists, exists because it has some good that it is putting out into the world. And whatever role you play in that company, you play some part in doing some service for somebody somewhere that may be kind of abstract for you, but think about how it fits into the big picture. If your job is a job worth having, it is one that somehow improves the quality of life for somebody whether in healthcare, education, energy, defense, whatever it is. Not to mention day-to-day the interactions that you have in your workplace or in your home are opportunities for you to actively love your coworker, to actively love your customers, to be loving and patient and servant-hearted, that they would get a sense, wow, this person really cares for me. Even to the point that you would be able to share the gospel with them, the way that Paul and Silas and Timothy did in Thessalonica. Okay, the guy in the cubicle next to you at your job will probably not come here to listen to me preach, but he will sit down over your lunch break and let you read the gospel with him. When you work, you're loving your family by providing for them financially. Those of you who are stay at home parents, what is that if not loving? Every day you are clocking in to love, really think about this, to love some of the most vulnerable people in our society. There is nobody that is more at risk than little children, and you get to be there every day to meet their needs and care for them. There's also no demographic that's maybe more in need of evangelizing than little kids. Moms, stay-at-home moms, you get to do that every day. You get to clock in and love these little people that God has given you to care for and share the gospel with them. It's incredible. And we can go on and on to just think about how love affects the way that we work. We submit to our superiors, living quietly, working heartily, not as to men, but unto God. 
what Paul says in Colossians 3. Or vice versely, if you, vice versely, if you are in authority in your workplace, you are loving and shepherding your employees in a way that testifies to the love that Christ has shown us. Maybe the biggest point from this text, you work hard so that you can have more money to contribute to the needs of your brothers and sisters in the church. You work hard at that job that you don't always like that much so that the sick are cared for, so that orphans are adopted in our church, so that the gospel will go out around the world. And the harder you work, the more money you have to give to the ministry of Jesus Christ. That'll pick you up when you got a case of the Mondays. I am working hard so that this labor can go towards the love of my brothers and sisters. Whatever it is you do, let that love of Christ be overflowing in your work. Verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. I love that the Apostle Paul frames this whole section in terms of how this looks to the world outside. What do they see when they look in at the church? In the case of Thessalonica, do they see a bunch of parasites mooching off of a few wealthy members and contributing nothing to society? In our case, do they see a community that struggles with the right perspective of work that idolizes work for the same wrong reasons that the world does? Or do they see a spiritual family? Do they see a group of people that surprisingly, radically loves one another, that is committed to one another, that is generous and meets the needs of not only those within the household of faith, but those outside? Do they look at us and say, See how they love each other. May that be so. Let's pray. God, we do praise you for the work that you have done on our behalf in Jesus Christ when we were not a part of your family, but we were in fact alienated from God. That we were separated from your people and justly deserving wrath. Lord, we confess that we were terribly sick with sin. And we praise you that you did not distance yourself from us, but you came near to us and took our sickness on yourself. You have borne our iniquities. And by your wounds, we are healed. So God, I pray that that love we have received from you would overtake us, that we would be more enraptured by the grace that we have received in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, because of that, we would be a more loving and generous people. And that the world would look at us and they would see your love, that they would know that we are in fact your disciples by the way that we love one another. Transform us, we ask, by your spirit through this word today. Amen. Let us stand to respond. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold shepherd will be
Amen. Be seated one more time for just a minute. As I said before, I know that these are unsettling times. And if nothing else, this should remind us that we are all mortal. We are all going to, God, to die. And God knows just when. And if you die in your sins, you will go to hell. And you will suffer eternally more than anyone has ever or will ever suffer in this life. But you can be healed of your sin. You, even right now, can put your faith in Jesus who came near to us in our sickness to transfer our death off of us and onto himself. And we can have what we just sang, a certain hope the future is sure that Jesus has paid the price that we are forgiven and we will always have eternal life with God. So if these things that are going on right now are concerning you and you have not put your hope in God, that might be why this is happening. So that more people will turn and know that their hope is only in Jesus Christ. Please, I beg you, hope in Christ right now and no matter what happens in this life, you will have you will have eternal life with Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have been taught by God to love one another, let's do so more and more. I don't know what the, the next weeks and months hold, but I know that this is a great opportunity for us to come together as a family, to press in and care for one another, to try and meet the needs of one another. Please don't in this time grow distant from one another, but Press into one another, contact one another, keep in touch with one another, and make sure that we all make it to the end together. One of the ways that we do that is to continue to meet the needs of the saints through your financial contributions. So if you are able to do that, please don't stop. I know that many of you ordinarily, you come on a Sunday morning and you put your offering in an envelope in the box. Well, you can't do that. But there are other ways that you can continue to contribute to this shared fund that we distribute to the mission of our church. So you can come into our church office, you can mail a check to our church office, or you can find on our website a way to sign up for the online giving portal. But please make provision to see that the, the ministry of our church does not stop 
given the circumstances that we are under right now. Now more than ever, we can display the love of Christ through our generosity. So with that, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul's prayer for the church. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Amen. You're dismissed.